of Daniel. I hope your Bible's been a couple of weeks, so let's uh, get back in to the book of Daniel. The title tonight, actually I have two titles. You can choose one or the other. I don't care which one. Uh, taken directly from the scripture, we're talking about the ancient of days. And this is a really, really great section of scripture. But you can alternate title if you want to go with something different. More apt description is the courtroom of the king. So that's, that's going to be more along the lines of what we're talking about. Last time that we met and talked about Daniel, we hit rewind. If you remember, this starting in chapter 7, we are no longer going in a linear order. We're, we're going to be jumping back and forth. And last week, or last time that we met, we rewound, rewinded? I don't know how to do the past tense of that. We pressed rewind and went backwards several years from Darius's reign to Belshazzar's reign. In this section, we're going to fast forward potentially thousands of years forward. Because the things that are going to happen here in this section have not yet occurred. And that is to say, if you follow the same kind of literal premillennial interpretation of eschatology that I do, uh, if you don't, then these events have already happened and you can go on your merry way. But I have not seen a, a perfect fulfillment of what we're seeing here in Daniel chapter 7. And I do not believe we're going to see it until the very end. And so uh, we'll kind of talk about that. But the, the events that happen here correlate directly to the events in Revelation chapter 19. So if you want to draw connecting, connecting points, we will we'll throw in a few of those as we go. Um, it's going to happen immediately after the Battle of Armageddon and before, I believe, the millennial reign of Christ. So that's, that's kind of the, the time period that we're talking about. we got to remember before we jump into this, there are so many symbolic, prophetic, and metaphoric references here. Because we are in a different genre. The first section of the book was, was narrative. It was history. It's telling us a story. But this is prophecy, so we have to interpret accordingly. You're going to see a lot of things that are metaphors. And, and, and we'll talk through each of those as we go. So let's go Daniel chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 7. I know we already covered verse 7 last time, but I want to recover it because it connects into what we're talking about. And we're going to read through verse 14. 7, 7 through 14. Remember, Daniel himself is now having a dream that he doesn't understand, which I think is the height of irony that he's interpreted everybody else's dreams, but now he gets to interpret his, or he needs someone to interpret his own dream. So in the midst of it, they've, he's seen four things. He's seen four things come out of the, the, the ocean there, the, the sea, and there are four beasts. And now I want to specifically talk about this last one. So verse 7 says, After this, while I was watching in the night visions, suddenly a fourth beast appeared, frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong with large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed. It trampled with its feet whatever was left. It was different from the beasts before it, and it had, what? Ten horns. That's going to be really important. While I was considering the horns, suddenly another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. And suddenly in this horn there were eyes, like the eyes of a human, and a mouth that was speaking arrogantly. Okay, you see what I mean about prophetic imagery? This is obviously symbolic. This is a symbol of something that we're going to understand. He, I believe, I do think he saw this literally. I think, this is, I think he saw exactly what he's describing, but I believe the interpretation of it is going to be a, a metaphoric interpretation, or a symbolic one. Verse 9, as I kept watching... Thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was like snow, and the hair of his head was like whitest wool. His throne was flaming fire, and its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was convened. The books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the arrogant words the horn was speaking. As I continued watching, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was removed, but an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. I continued watching in the night visions, and suddenly one like the Son of Man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, 
and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. All right, there is a lot going on. This is such an incredible scene. What I love about this is that I believe that we will witness this. With our own eyes, I believe that we will see this scene come to pass. So let's, let's talk about it, let's pray, and then, and then we'll kind of walk through this, this section. Father, we love you, and we do thank you for your word. It is sometimes difficult, and we embrace that. We don't understand everything, nor will we ever in this life. And so we labor with uh, hearts devoted to you and minds fixed on Christ, with the help of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand, as, as uh, Anselm said, uh, just a little bit. Lord, just give us a little bit of understanding, and, and tomorrow maybe a little bit more. And we ask, uh, Lord, for you to illuminate your word. You've given us this not to conceal things from us, but to reveal who you are and what you're doing for us, Lord. And so I pray that you'd help us to understand uh, this, this word tonight. Thank you for uh, this book. Thank you for everybody here tonight, I pray. Uh, that you would that you would move through your word tonight. We ask this in the, the name of the Son of Man who's coming on, on the clouds of heaven. Lord, we, we wait with eager attention to see him and to see all things made new through him. Through him, we pray. Amen. All right, this is, without a doubt, one of the most theologically and eschatologically important passages in the Bible. When I talk about eschatology, uh, it's a very specific branch of theology and it talks just about the end times. So when I say eschatology, I'm talking about the doctrine of the end times. The book of Daniel, book of Revelation, uh, and, and those kind of things. So this is, right here, we're going to see ultimate victory of our king and his righteous judgment over this world. This is where everything on earth is moving toward. This is where, like, as a Christian today, we ask, like, what's the point of our faith? Why are we here? Why do we exist? In part, for this moment, that one day his people will look and behold our king reigning in all his glory with no sin to stand uh, between us, with no, no enemies to, uh, to, to threaten or encroach on his kingdom. He destroys everybody and, and his kingdom reigns eternal. This is going to be an amazing moment. If you look at your notes, I've set it up in a little bit different of a way. I wanted to organize this in a way that made sense. On the left side, you're going to see numbers one and three. That's not the order we're going to go in, but that's just going to see those are talking about the the little horn that we see here, or we're going to call him the fourth beast, and we'll kind of talk about his identity. And then on the right side, it's the king, and we're going to talk about both uh, two parts of, of the Trinity, the two persons of the Trinity in in this. So, but we are going to go one, two, three, four. So it's it's going to kind of zigzag a little bit, make a Z with your notes as we as we go through it. So the first thing, top left corner, you're going to look at this. The crime of the beast. The crime of the beast. So you saw here in verse 10, it said the court was convened. If there's a court and there's a judge seated on, uh, on this throne, then what does that tell us? A crime has to have been committed. There's no reason to convene a court and have a judge if there's no crime that's been committed. So let's, uh, we're, we're going to talk uh, about this. First, let's talk about the one who is on trial. Uh, we'll call him the, the Little Horn. We're going to call him the Little Horn. Remember in context here, when it talks about this beast, what do the beasts represent in this passage? The Antichrist? Yeah, you're getting a little bit ahead of me. Oh, I'm sorry. You, I, I was, that was going to be the big reveal. It was going to be so epic. Now it's not going to be as... Oh, sorry. Uh, as, the Little Horn? Yeah, so what do the, the beasts in Daniel's vision represent, though? Kingdoms. Kingdoms. So four kingdoms. He sees four successive kingdoms that are going to reign. So coming from this fourth beast here, this fourth kingdom, we know this. If, if, if the interpretation, and we're going to get to this, this little horn, if he is the Antichrist, and I don't believe he's existed yet, if that's true, then the, the lifespan of this fourth beast is, is way longer than the lifespan of Rome. Rome is the, the direct interpretation. This first beast, the fourth beast, represents the Roman Empire. But the Roman Empire ended in 476. So it, the Roman Empire collapsed from years of uh, internal fighting and corruption from within. So this fourth beast represents more than just Rome. And so the, the way that traditionally we've kind of looked at it is that it, the, it, we can look at it as the lingering shadow of the spirit of Rome. So that the ferocity and the crushing violence that came out of Rome 
continues in this world, even till today. So in the world governments of today, even, there is the face of this fourth beast still exists and still is, uh, is, is active. From that spirit grows ten horns. Again, this is very difficult to interpret. Whether this means that this represents ten separate kingdoms, or in, now later in this chapter we are going to see an angel declares that this is ten kings. So that's, it's, we've got to be careful you know, with not going beyond what Scripture says. Uh, but if you, if you come from a like more dispensational background like I do, typically what they'll say is these ten kings are a ten-nation block of you know, a superpower that's going to arise at some point in the future, maybe ten European nations that will, that will rise up and the Antichrist will come from one of those nations. It, that's hard to say. Whether they all appear at the same time or whether they appear in succession, we don't know. But from that spirit of the fourth beast, we see ten kingdoms or ten kings arise. And we see, this is going to come out of this. In scripture, horns are really important too. They symbolize power and authority. They're often connected with kingship, with reigning and with kings. So specifically we're told, verse 24 of chapter 7, that the ten horns are ten kings who will rise from this kingdom. And like we talked about, there's a couple of ways to interpret that. Um, that could be describing human history from, from Rome till today, a succession of, of kings that have come from that same lineage, or it could represent a, a ten-state European block. Either way, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't, it doesn't affect it because those kingdoms are ultimately going to fall. And from that comes this little horn. Now, given what we know, and this was going to be my big reveal, I have it highlighted and everything. Sorry. No, it's okay. I forgive you. Uh, I listened to a sermon this week about forgiving even when you can't forget. So that was, uh, that was good. Yeah, that was, so I forgive you. I'm not going to forget about that. But no. <laughs> but given what we know about other passages in Daniel... And then as, as we go later, even into the book of Revelation, I don't see another way to interpret this outside of it being the Antichrist. I don't. Now, we, we have tons of disagreement. We really could. There, there's a lot of people that would come, and some theologians are going to say, even some that I really respect, are going to come and say, no, that this, this was not... This, this was either Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, who was a Syrian ruler who conquered Judea in the time of the Maccabees, like in the, in the 400 years of silence between Malachi and, and uh, the, the New Testament writers. Um, so they'll say that because he does fulfill some of the things. He, he, he was called an abomina uh, abomination that brings desolation because he sacrificed pigs in the temple itself. Uh, he, they enslaved the people. They did all these things. So... There, there's some similarities. Other people will come out and say it was Nero. Nero was, was the fulfillment of this. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different things, but when you look at the whole picture and you're wanting to find the best fulfillment of the prophecies in the book of Daniel related to this little horn, it has got to be the Antichrist. It is so clear when we see it next to the beast starting in Revelation chapter 13. In fact, coming out of that, in Revelation 13, let's go there for just a sec. Um, I'm not going to read a lot there, but to me, the very first time he appears kind of shows us that this is the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7. Look at chapter 13. Of Revelation. It says, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. This is verse 1. It had what? Ten horns! Ten horns. And seven heads, on its heads were ten crowns, and on its heads were blasphemous names. The beast I saw, here it is, church, the beast I saw was like what? A leopard, its feet were like bears, its mouth was like lions. So I'm going to stop there. I, just from the get-go, this is, this is the same imagery that Daniel is in the middle of a vision, seeing a leopard, a bear, a lion, and finally this fourth beast. I, I, that... If that is a coincidence, then I, the biblical writers, I, and I, I, I say this tongue-in-cheek, the biblical writers made a big mistake. Using the same imagery for two different realities does not make sense to me. I believe this is the same person. I think it's the same individual human being that we're talking about. We know it's a man, because look at, look at the interpretation here. He, sees, he calls it a little horn, but then he says, 
uh, it was lifted up from the ground. It set, oh, I'm sorry, that's, that's earlier. Um, let me get to where, where was I in verse? Uh, verse 3. Verse, no, I'm sorry, in, in, back in Daniel chapter okay. 7. Um, uh, verse 8, it says, uh, Suddenly a little horn, or a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted. So that probably means he, he conquered these, these kingdoms, or he replaced them. And suddenly in this horn, and here's how we know this is a human, were eyes like the eyes of a human, and a mouth that was speaking arrogantly. This is symbolic of the fact that this was, this was a human being, or this will be a human being. I do believe that Daniel actually saw a beast, but the interpretation of it is it's going to be a, a human being. So let's, let's talk about this Antichrist. Now, the book of First John talks and says there have been many Antichrists, little a, many who have come opposing Christ. That's all that means is... is opposite of Christ, or opposing Christ, standing against Christ. But this is big A, Antichrist. Uh, he, he's the one who is supernaturally empowered by Satan to uh, draw the world into worship of the dragon, which is Satan, and to deceive the world, to bring the wrath uh, of the king. So, I love how it starts, though, because this is another area that we can't be dogmatic on, but it says here he's called a little horn. A uh, horn came up, a little one. We don't know what that means. There's a lot of debate. Whether that means, there are some people who would take that literally and say, it's going to be a little man, like a short man. I, I don't know. Everything else is symbolic. I don't know why that one thing Lord would, Lord would, would, yeah, Lord Lord Lord. Uh, would it, I, I don't see that. I, I tend to look more symbolically when we understand that, that maybe his, his upbringing or his importance or the start of his life is small and unimportant. That he comes out of out of a place of, in, in much the same way that, that Christ came not as a, a reigning king, but he came as a humble baby and born in a manger, uh, we're going to see, and, and we saw it as we walked through Revelation last year, but uh, when Satan brings this individual, his, his superpower, his, his ultimate weapon against the church, when he brings it, he forms what we call, a, theologically, an unholy trinity as the dragon as father, the beast as son, and the false prophet as, as the Holy Spirit. So maybe this is that. He, he had a humble origin, a humble beginning, and he rose up. The word in Hebrew is Zed, and it doesn't, we, can, we, we know one thing for sure. It does not refer to his power or influence, because those two things are anything but small. If we connect pieces of this puzzle, we're going to discover this little horn, Revelation chapter 13, 3 through 4, is going to cause the whole earth to follow him and worship him. This is a tremendous amount of power and influence that this individual will wield, empowered by Satan himself, so demonically orchestrated, but he, he gets the entire world to worship him, except for those, those few uh, tribulation saints who will ultimately give their lives uh, for the for the cause of the gospel, but so th this is who he is. He's, he's a little horn. We don't know why he's little, but his power and influence are, are gigantic here. Now let's talk about his crime because this is the, the crime of the little horn. All right, it, this in this section here we're not going to get very much. We're just going to get the kind of the broad overview. Later they're going to describe what what. He, you know, what, in, in more explicit detail what this uh, crime is. But what are we told here in verse 8? What are we told is his crime? Just two words. He was speaking arrogantly. arrogantly. He was speaking arrogantly. Now, given the severity of the punishment he receives, we have to make some conclusions about that arrogant speech. I mean, I worked in youth ministry for seven years before I became a, a senior pastor, I've heard some arrogant speech. There's nothing, nothing more arrogant than junior high boys playing sports together. Like, that is the age where they're, it, I mean, the, uh, adrenaline, testosterone, you know, they're going through puberty, all these things. I've never seen more arrogant people. There's seventh grade boys just are the, the height of it. So it, it's not just that. It's not just a word of pride or arrogance. And so we have to make, we have to deduce some things to make some conclusions about his speech. This is just the tip of the iceberg for this person's crimes. We're, we're not, this is not the revelation of everything here. But we can glean a couple of things. One from the Hebrew word that's used for arrogant, 
and then also from the larger context of the chapter. The Hebrew word is here that they use is rab rab. So I really like saying that all week. Uh, it's been fun. Rab 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 rab. Um, and it's not the typical word for pride. So this is not the word uh, when when um, you know when we talk about uh, uh, you know pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's not the same word. This word actually means great and mighty, and typically it's not used negatively. Yeah, Mike he, says speaking great things. So that's 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 a much better interpretation, a much better translation, and that's that's what is it. So speaking arrogantly, they're inferring his 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 arrogance, which is okay given the context, but really that's a better interpretation. Usually this word is used to describe a chieftain or a king. This word is used to describe the Lord. And, and we'll talk a little bit about this. So why is this a crime to speak about things that are great and mighty? I want to hear your opinions on this. And if you're bragging about it, don't have to be boastful. Yeah, definitely what is happening. Bragging it in God, probably. Yeah. So, in, 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 that's definitely what's happening, and I think this is, this is the reason why the punishment was so severe. And I have a couple of things. The great and mighty things, it's one thing to, to and, and this is exactly what you said, it, it's one thing to talk great and mighty things. It's another to speak it about yourself. This is, that's what he's doing here. This word was used in Daniel 4.3 to describe and it was attributed to God himself. So what is happening in this section is that this little horn is robbing God of what rightly belongs to him. He's saying the attributes that belong to God, his perfection, his wisdom, his love, his, his glory, his dominion, all those things, they're me, they're mine, I want them now. That, that's a dangerous place to be. And then also from the broader context of this chapter, Daniel 7.25 says this about him. He will speak words against the Most High. So not only is this individual elevating himself, he's also blaspheming the Lord. So that, that's the, the two sides. That, that's his crime. That's, that's the crime. That's what's happening here is, is the, the arrogant speech. Let's, let's move on. Let's keep going. Number two, let's kind of slide over. Instead of going down, let's slide over, and we're going to look at the side with the, with the king. And it starts with this, the wrath of the king. The wrath of the king. So he was speaking arrogantly, and then everything changes in a moment. Verse 9, as I was watching, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head was like white as wool. His throne was flaming fire, its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was convened, the books were open. This is an amazing scene, and I have a lot of good stuff I want to say about it. First of all, who is the Ancient of Days? That's the first question. Let's let's talk about. We we identify the little beast or little little beastie, uh, little horn. Uh, who is the ancient of days? Gosh. Specifically. Jesus. No. Oh. God the Father. This is this is the Lord. This is Yahweh, God the Father. This is a spectacular vision. When you consider what Daniel is seeing, he is seeing God Himself on a throne. This is a vision that only a small handful of prophets ever got the, the privilege of seeing, even a glimpse of God's blazing glory like this. Moses, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel were the only ones who were able to see the Father in, in whatever veiled glory. Now Moses saw him just briefly through the cleft of the rock, uh, Isaiah saw the Lord in his temple and, and hid his face and said, Oh, woe is me, I am a sinner, I am a man undone. Ezekiel saw the Lord lifted up on a, on a throne carried by cherubim. And then Daniel here. What I love about this, so there was a select few, those superstars in the Old Testament that got to, that got to witness this. But what I love about this is that every single believer, every cotton-picking one of us, will get to see this with our eyes. With our own eyes. We will get to see this, every one of us. And it's not going to be in the cleft of the rock. It's not going to be uh, through covered eyes in the temple, through uh, the, the smoke of his glory. We're going to see him with, with completely uncovered eyes. See God the Father on his throne. It's going to be amazing. Job 19.27, I will see him myself. I love that. My eyes will behold him and not as a stranger. Oh, how my heart longs within me. 
this, this, I mean, this is what we've been talking about on Sunday nights, the beatific vision. The, the ultimate reality for the believer, not just to hear about God from a distance, but to see him face to face. I love how Daniel's one of the select few who saw a vision of this, but we're going to, every one of us, from the lowliest believer, who, who uh, the thief on the cross, who, who walked with Jesus the total of five minutes, maybe one minute, got to see Got to see God the Father in all His glory. Jesus said this, Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And then 1 John 3, 2, When He appears, we will see Him as He is. This is an incredible thought. I mean, just, just the fact that we're witnessing God the Father on His throne. Yeah. What about God and His Spirit? We're going to talk about it. I got more. I got more. I'm not done. Okay. Yes. Because all of this is symbolic. We... we, we, we Okay. He I'll, saw something. Okay, I'll catch you now. What he saw was what he's describing, but the reality of it is is so, I mean, simple. It would just be like us seeing something thousands and thousands and thousands of years in the future, and they're like, okay, describe it. Yes, that's basically yeah. where we're at. Well, no, I mean, and, and I think not. that's that's a good way to look at like the Book of Revelation, what he yeah. was seeing. Yeah. But I, I do believe that he was seeing the things that he said, because this right. is not this is not real. This is a vision. This is a right. dream. Right. But I think each of the components of it represent something, and that's that's what we're gonna we're gonna see because we do know John four twenty four. That was literally my next sentence. We know from from Jesus's own words, God is spirit. So he takes it, God the Son takes human flesh and and in his incarnation. But God has no has no physical form. And so all the way throughout Scripture, we see these these moments of personification. We talk about the Lord's strong right arm. We talk about the, the eyes of the Lord on the righteous and the unrighteous. So those those things are, are used metaphorically because he sees, but he has no no physical eyes. He has strength, but no physical hands. It, it's, it's kind of hard to wrap my mind around this. But so we know that, having known that, we know when we see God on his throne, he, he doesn't have legs to sit. He doesn't have clothing to wear. He doesn't have hair on his head. Like we, we know those things. Jesus does, but these are all representative truths about God. So let's talk about what they represent. So he's seeing this, but what is what is this going to be for us? So the throne itself represents his power, his authority, his sovereignty, his kingship, his rule, and his reign. The only one who sits on a throne in heaven. Now we've talked about Revelation. There are 24 elders who sit on thrones. I mean, we will got into that. Maybe we'll get into it in the future again. But uh, the one who sits on the throne, this throne of fire at the center of all things is, is God the Father. But it represents power, authority, sovereignty, kingship, rule, and reign. His white clothes and hair in this image represent purity, righteousness, and innocence. He is, and what's interesting about it is that he's not just robed in white, but he's crowned with white. The hair of his head was, was white. He, from top to bottom, he's pure and righteous. The fire, now this is the thing that should have made the Antichrist tremble before him. Because the fire, it flows around him, it fl flows from his throne. The book of Revelation says there's lightning in his eyes and a sword in, in the mouth of Christ later on. But this is, the fire represents wrath, justice, and judgment. And where is the fire flowing from? From his throne. So a river of fire flows from his throne, from the place of his authority. He can judge because he himself is pure and innocent and holy and righteous, but he sits on a throne that is representing his sovereignty and his power. And so there's, uh, there's a lot of symbolism here. One thing that's really, really interesting too, and I wish I had time to get into it, but I don't, is for the... For the enemies of God, they see a river of fire coming out from his throne in heaven. What do the saints see? What do the, what do the, the people of God see? A river of, in Revelation 22.1, a river of life-giving water flowing from his throne and giving, and it, it says, uh, and giving water to, to all of the world. So I, I like that, that contrast there. You're going to stand before God one way or another. You're going to stand before the great white throne, this, this throne of God himself. You're going to stand there either as a conquered enemy about to be cast into hell or as a, a servant, as a friend, as a, a co-heir with Christ. And that, that, that decision is completely up to us, whether, whether you come to faith in Jesus Christ or not. 
this is a challenge. I used, I to, work, I used to work with a guy that said, where it says his hair was like wool, but that proved God was black. Was black. I've seen that. Um, <laughs> oh. That's a that's an interesting <laughs> that's an interesting way to in, interpret a word literally in a section of of imagery and prophetic imagery. Even tell him it doesn't matter. <laughs> I think it's more likely that it, it's it's pointing us to the, the imagery of a lamb. Than, than, a, than a human being. I used to remember I worked for the school district in Dallas in the summertime we delivered food to schools and parks and all and there was a black church that we delivered to when they had the last supper and all the disciples are black, black. and everything. Yeah. Um, they probably weren't white. They weren't white. They were Middle Eastern. They were yeah. Palestinian. Yeah. I mean, we we recognize that Jesus wasn't blonde hair, blue yeah. eye. Like we no. know he wasn't. Yes, he was, because that was the picture on my Bible. Yeah, <laughs> with, the, with the white robe the and the, the powder hair. blue sash. Yes. That's what Jesus <laughs> had to have that powder blue sta sash. Yeah. Yes. And I also, what Bible she's talking about? For for him to have a white robe in the first place in first century Palestine would not sparkling. would not have been accurate. Yeah. Now Herod probably had a white robe because he could afford it, but uh, definitely not. But I love this scene because it, it draws me in, in my in my imagination and looking forward that I will see him not in this way. I will not see him as the wrathful king bringing judgment, but I'll see him as the welcoming king inviting me forever into his kingdom. It says that he is surrounded by angels. Uh, they call them servants here, but in context we're going to see a little bit later next week about that these are angels. Um, this points us to the fact that he's ruling them, commanding, and they're worshiping him, that, that, uh, that he is reigning over all things. This verse, when it says there's thousands upon thousands, ten thousand times ten thousand, that's probably hyperbole. Um, one commentator suggested that this is the biggest number that Daniel could have conceived of at this time. He didn't have a concept of billions. He didn't have a concept of trillions or whatever we're up to now, quadrillions. He, he, the biggest concept in his mind in terms of numbers would have been 10,000 times 10,000, which equals 100 million. I think there's more than that, um, but, but we don't know exactly how many angels there are. But if each angel, if you think about every encounter with angels in Scripture, and we're going to talk about it on Sunday in, in Hebrews, because this next section is about angels, if every encounter with an angel uh, caused people absolute terror and panic, the G Roman guards, they, it says they, they became as dead men. Uh, Daniel himself is going to encounter an angel, and he's going to fall on his face for days and not be able to get up. Uh, if that's the case, and he has at least 100 million around him serving him, again, this is, this is a, just a small picture of his omnipotence and his, and his sovereignty, that he can rule 100 million angels who are each more powerful than us, and he can rule them with, with, from this place of, of perfection and glory and sovereignty and wonder. So I, I love this, this whole scene. Uh, we, we see here the wrath of the king falling on who? Who does the wrath fall on? The little horn, the little beastie. Um, number three, the killing of the beast. I say killing because I, I started with a, a k in the first section. Crime and killing. I, I want to alliterate. Okay, I gotta ask a question. Yeah. Okay, so this is, it's, it's, he's seeing this, but I thought Jesus was going to be the one that opens the books. And he's going to be the one at the great white throne judgment. This is not the great white throne judgment. No. No. This is the judging of the beast at the okay. end of Revelation 19. Okay. Okay. The great white throne judgment comes in Revelation 20 after the millennium. Okay. Okay. And that, that section, yes, the books were opened and the dead were judged according to their words. That's, that's that section. This is just the trial of the beast, where the beast and the false prophet get thrown into the lake of fire. And Satan himself at that point is bound for a thousand years while the saints enjoy the, the millennial reign of Christ. So, um, but yeah, so it, but it, the timelines get very difficult to, to, to work out. And I think that's less in focus as the ultimate realities. Sin is judged, Christ returns. The, the finality of those things is, is really what, what the writers are trying to, to get us to, to put our eyes on. Let's talk about this. If there's a crime and the judge has cast a verdict, 
Here is the sentence, verses 11 and 12. Let's look at 11 and 12. I watched then, and look at this. Daniel was, where were his eyes in verses 9 and 10? On Jesus, on the throne. On the throne with the Father, okay? Now where do his eyes turn? A little more. I watched. Why? Because the sound of the arrogant words the horn was speaking. Think, just think about this. You see this image of God the Father with the fire before it is flowing out of his throne in, in fury and, and righteousness and wrath. And what is he still doing? What is this little horn still doing? Still talking. Like if there was a moment, if you ever, I don't know about you when you raise your kids, if your kids are talkative or not, do your kids get in trouble for talking in class or whatever. But there's a moment when you look up and you see the teacher and she's just staring at you and you're like, I went too far. All right, I went one, I, I should have stopped in my tracks. I should have stopped. This should have been the moment where Daniel, shut up. Stop. What, what are you doing? Do you not see what I'm seeing in this moment? But it says he's speaking arrogant. He's blaspheming. As I continued watching, this is the whole fanfare of this. The beast was killed. Its body destroyed and given over to the burning fire. Now, this is, this, there's a dual interpretation here. His, his, his destruction here signifies the end of this fourth beast, the kingdom that came from, from this beast, but it also signifies his own destruction. As a, as a mortal human being, he is, he is literally destroyed and cast into hell. Now we do see in Revelation 19 that this happens at the word of Christ, that Christ speaks, the sword in his mouth destroys his enemies, destroys the beast, the, the false prophet, and also all of the armies Isn't that they have gathered. Yeah. In 20, Revelation 20, they don't talk about Gog and Magog. Too, that's, right? the, that's another battle. Yeah, so these are, so what's the, I mean, we don't know the timeline, obviously, so I'm going to read from this to that. Like. From, so I, I think there's a thousand years separating those two Indeed. moments. I think, I, I, I look at all the sequence of events as, as, we are given literal timelines there. A lot of people don't. A lot of people look at, because the word thousand is often used metaphorically in scripture, like his love for a thousand generations. They don't ten literally thousand, mean that. They mean generation. many, 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 many generations. So there's a lot. I, I think that Battle of Armageddon happens, and then Christ reigns physically here on earth in a renewed world for a thousand years while Satan is bound. Satan is released in one, one last moment. The children, who were the people who were born during those thousand years, side with the dragon and, and they rebel, and Christ finally destroys all sin and, and destroys this whole world and, and creates. That's when the New Jerusalem comes into play. The timelines are fuzzy though, and I'm never going to be dogmatic on them. Oh well, yeah, because yeah. that's one thing. It'd be it'd be scary to make to make something to be so clear on something that isn't. So clear in scripture, right. um, but that's what I believe, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna back down from that. Um, so let's keep going. So we see the judge seated, courts convened, little horn still speaking blasphemy against the one seated on the throne. It catches Daniel's attention. He's like, "What? I, are you not seeing what I'm seeing here? No remorse, no sorrow, no change of heart, even standing before the judge in his righteousness. This is just pure, wicked, prideful hatred of God." If you want to read this in connection with Revelation, it's Revelation 19 to 20. So if you want to look at that. This right here for me, though, as a believer, this is justice made real. This is everything that, that a believer longs for, that sin be judged and that, that justice become real. Verse 12 tells us here uh, where it says that, that there was an extension of life granted to some of the others for a certain period of time. All this shows is that God is sovereign over all kingdoms and that every kingdom is temporary. So the strongest kingdoms that have ever existed eventually fall. America, I, I mean, I, I love my nation, but America is eventually going to cease to exist. Doesn't it talk about that in Daniel too? I forget what chapter about how the eagle loses its wings. It depends on how you interpret it. it. Yeah, yes. and it talks about the bear coming yeah. out, which would be possibly Russia. We're not mentioning in the Revelation. Like, yeah, but those beasts, they tell you in Daniel exactly what kingdom they are. Right. So, yeah, uh -oh. there's a lot of ways to look at it. <laughs> Again, that's why I'm not going to ever be dogmatic about it. But no, but... Uh, the, Do you not believe the, the that's thing, symbolic? I, I don't, but I don't believe it's America. I, no, I know, but I'm saying you not believe it's like a country? or you? Oh, no, yeah, I do. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I definitely think those, those are nations represented. Yeah, okay. um, I, so, the thing is, though, saying 
that America is not there. It, it it's not that we can't make an argument from silence. Yeah. It's it's not there, but that's not where the focus is. Right. The focus is on the other side of the world, and the focus is on what's happening in Israel during okay. that time. Okay. So its absence speaks, but I we can't be really definitive on on that. Um, Revelation 19.20, though, that's, that's where we see. But all kingdoms are going to fail. All kingdoms are going to lose their authority. There is only one eternal kingdom, and we see it right here. And it's not a leopard, a bear, a lion, or a ten-horned beast that rules over it. It's, it's a lamb that rules over this kingdom. So that's the last thing, number four. Let's finish up the reign of the king. So we had the wrath of the king. Now we have the reign of the king. Verse 13. I watched then, uh, let me see, verse 13, where am I? I continued watching in the night visions, and suddenly one like the Son of Man was coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, who is this? This is Jesus Christ. This is the second person of the Trinity. We saw God the Father. This is God the Son. He was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days. He was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. This is Jesus. It, the imagery here, the easy connecting point here, is coming with the clouds of heaven. This same phrase is used repeatedly about Christ. Uh, Matthew 24, 30. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Uh, Mark 13, 26. They will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them, where? In the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. In Revelation 1, 7, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be an end. This is just a tiny glimpse of a really key part of our faith that does not get talked about enough. Mm. We focus so much on this present world mm -hmm. and on our mm. pit pity pitiable little lives inside it. But this right here is talking about what theologians call the parousia, or the coming of Christ, the return of Christ. This is the moment that every believer should be longing for mm -hmm. every day. And, and it's hard because I know I, I was talking about heaven one day with a pastor friend of mine, and he said, well, he's like, of course I want Christ to come back, but I want him to wait just a little bit because I want to see my kids grow up and I want to walk my daughter down the aisle and, and I, want to, I, want to, you know, I want to do these things. I, you know, and I said, I said, yeah, I get it. In, in your humanity, sure, you want to do those things. But there's nothing better. You, you want your kids to have that, that temporary moment of happiness. I, I don't mean marriage is a temporary moment of happiness, but that temporary <laughs> might be if you keep that temporary. That you know that, that moment of getting married. Yeah, that's a great moment. But we will we will join with our groom as the bride of Christ in, in glory. There's nothing better. I, yeah, I want to see my daughters grow up, but more, I want to see my daughters in the presence of God. Yes. I want to see my my daughters worshiping Jesus together. I got to stop. Worshiping Jesus together with me, and that's what we're seeing here. This is just a tiny glimpse, but this is what we long for. That's why John said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And when he returns, he's going to establish an eternal kingdom that will never fade, never fall. If you remember, we talked about the Trinity a couple weeks ago in church, and we see the same thing here. We see that the Son of Man comes, and he is distinct from, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm wrapping up. I'll be up there in just a second. Right above? Okay, I'm coming. Uh, but here in this section, we see the Son of Man is set apart from, from the Ancient of Days. They're distinct from one another. However, we're given the fact that they, they both share in that same ruling, reigning, sovereign kingdom. So they're distinct, but they are one in character and purpose. So this is the doctrine of God's Trinitarian quality, even in the book of Daniel. It's everywhere. Okay, so some specific takeaways, and I have to go pretend to be a missionary. Uh, upstairs. Um, I'm gonna do, yeah, that's I forgot uh, about Bob. that. He's a missionary. He's a real life missionary. Yeah, I, it's a skit that we're oh, doing. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, I have to do okay. that. Some specific takeaways. Three <laughs> things that are coming. Judgment is coming. So be ready. Is your soul prepared to stand before your Creator? Because you're going to stand before Him in one of two ways: either before His fiery throne of wrath, or His His welcoming presence. If you have never been made right by the atoning work of Jesus Christ, now is the time. Come to faith in Jesus. 
Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed for people once to die. And after this, judgment. That, that, that judgment, that's, it's, it's a, everything hangs on that. Which judgment will you be in? Will you be in the judgment of whether your book is in, name is written in the book of life or will you be in the judgment of, of how you served him? And so judgments come and be ready. Second thing, Christ is coming. So eagerly wait for him. Set your eyes on Jesus. Be ready, be eager to see him when he comes. He gave, Jesus gave so many parables about his people preparing for him, being ready for him, not being caught off guard, not, not being caught in sin when he comes. Philippians 3.20 says our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Last thing, justice is coming. So be encouraged. Every wickedness will be judged. Every sinner will be cast into hell. Every moment you've looked at this wicked world and said, how, 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 how does God allow things like this? Every moment of sin and, and guilt and wickedness is going to be made right. This, this, this moment where everything is, everything is washed away and all sin is judged it is, should be a moment for believers that we look forward to. Not that sinners be cast into hell. God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked, right? But we delight that justice is done and God's perfection is made right and made real. Um, that's that's what I have. Daniel said this was a fantastic session. I love this. Next week is going to get a little easier to digest. Uh, it, next week is kind of a, a recap of, of everything we've heard so far and kind of just help us to understand some things. So um, I do have to run and be a missionary, so I need to close it up here, but. Uh, I do appreciate you guys being here, and uh, if you have questions, write them down and bring them next week, because i got to go. Father, we love you. You are, you are sovereign and righteous. You are merciful to, you, to us, Lord, to your saints, and uh, we deserve to stand before that, that fiery throne and be judged, but Christ did that for us. He took, he took the judgment that we deserve, and so I can stand before you now as a righteous, redeemed saint. And it's not me, it is all you, and I give praise and glory and honor to you for your mercy and glory. I pray, Lord, that our eyes will be so fixed on Jesus that when we see him, we, we are ready and we rejoice in his coming. I pray, Lord, for our family members who don't know Christ as their Savior. I pray that you would give us just a little bit more time uh, to see them come to saving faith in Jesus. I pray that we would look to you in all things and recognize your sovereignty and fall on your mercy and that one day when we see you face to face and we see you with our own eyes, Lord, we can't wait for that moment and we give you praise that, that you, you'd allow us to, to even just glimpse you, let alone spend all eternity with you. So we praise you. I have no more words, Lord. I, I, I praise you for who you are. I thank you for this passage tonight. Lord, uh, teach us, obey it, uh, help us to obey you in all things. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.